Good morning, church. Again, I have the privilege to bring God's word to you today. We're going to be looking at um, three persons in the Old Testament. Um, their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, the title of my message today, The Power of Spiritual Fellowship. So where are we? We are at a point in history where Israel and Judah's apostasy has finally brought judgment. The idolatry led first to the northern kingdom of Israel being decimated and eventually carried away by the kingdom of Assyria. They are completely lost to history from around 721 BC. The southern kingdom takes longer, but their idolatry takes away the defense of God. And then Babylon, led by Nebuchadnezzar, eventually destroys Jerusalem and the temple around 587 BC. Although there would have been initial waves of exile of which Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been part of. So in the book of Daniel, um, it begins with these four persons, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as their Jewish names um, are also mentioned, it's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They are being under guard in the king's palace. So they've been um, captured and taken away from their home in Judah all the way to Babylon. And they're living in the king's palace. He has requested the young men of Israel who are of noble blood, good-looking, showing aptitude for all kinds of learning. You see, Nebuchadnezzar not only wanted to conquer the Israelites physically, but he wanted their hearts and minds as well. So he sets up what essentially is a university with a full scholarship to help bring about this transformation. But as we will see together, these young men, they strengthen their bonds of fellowship as they strive to hold on to God in a foreign land. So again, the title of my message, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, The Power of a Spiritual Fellowship. So my first point, it's a fellowship that disciplines its appetites. And that is taken from Daniel chapter 1, reading from verse 8. It says, and you will have to turn to your Bibles today because, um, because of different things. Uh, we won't be able to get any scriptures on the screen. So please have your Bibles at the ready. Um, so reading from Daniel 1 verse 8, it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Verse 11, then Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to the Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. You know, the scriptures say Daniel had resolved not to defile himself. The Jewish food laws were very clear about what should be eaten and what should not be eaten, what was unclean and what was clean. God used these laws in large part, in my opinion, to protect the health of the Israelites, to set them apart as holy before him, before, apart from the other nations. Daniel realized this and resolved not to defile himself. 
Lower down in verse 11, it says, When Daniel wasn't initially able to persuade the official who was in charge of them to change their diet, he went after the guard. So he was a very persistent guy. Who got, the, guy who, the guard who guarded them. Um, so he went after them. And also, not only Daniel went after them, but his companions who were with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that's their, 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 their Babylonian names. And they made a deal with him to test them with water and vegetables only for 10 days. All four of them, after the 10 days, looked so much better than the other men who ate the royal food and drank the royal wine that the God allowed them to continue their diet. In verse 17, it says, God blessed these four with wisdom and understanding. To Daniel, he gave the ability to understand visions and dreams. When Nebuchadnezzar interviewed them, he found no one equal to them and he entered them into his service. If we as a fellowship are to make a united impact, we must together learn to discipline our appetites. And it's not just food, but all of our senses. Our bodies, are, as God describes it, is wonderfully and fearfully made. Inside of us are bound up so many desires, passions, tastes, etc., God also says that we together are members of His body, His church, and we are called to be holy. What about our eyes? What are we looking at with our eyes? The wonders of God's creation or pornography or possessions, some woman or man we desire. Matthew 6.22 says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What about our ears? What are we listening to with our ears? Wholesome words, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs? God's wisdom in His Word, or are we listening to the latest gossip? Songs with empty lyrics that promote sex, violence, and greed? Or teachers who appeal to what we want to hear rather than convict us from the word about sin, righteousness, and judgment. What about our tongues? Do we gather to gossip or to build each other up as long as it is called today so that no one's heart is hardened by sin's deceitfulness? And yes, what about our physical bodies? Are we taking care of the temple of God? The Mosaic laws have been Fulfilled. We are not, not bound by the, these food laws anymore. But there is tremendous merit in watching our diet and exercising so that we can be physically able to carry out our day-to-day -day tasks and serve the kingdom of God with vigor and power by the Spirit of God. Over this COVID period, I had the opportunity, opportunity to spend some time at a brother's home. And my wife and I spent the night at their home. They happened to have a scale in the room we stayed and I took the opportunity to weigh myself. I was shocked to see that, that I had actually reached 200 pounds. I have never been that weight before. Also during this period, I was speaking to two separate brothers and we were able to work together on our purity. For two separate months, I got the opportunity, opportunity to pray and fast and have daily accountability as we strove to guard our eyes and for me personally to train myself to have one less meal in the day on both fronts from a purity standpoint and physically, because I started running and riding as well, I feel a lot better and look forward to working more and more with my brothers and sisters to discipline my desires, to discipline my appetite so that I can be practicing the godliness that God expects of me by the power of His grace. I challenge you, my family, in your circle of fellowship, discipline your desires for the purpose of godliness. God bless the fellowship of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel after they discipline their desires. I believe if we imitate them, He will bless us also. My second point, a fellowship that practices surrendered prayer. And we turn to Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 5. So I'll give you a little moment to turn. And it says, The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. This guy was serious. 
Uh, There's a threat that was continually repeated throughout the book of Daniel, to cut them to pieces and to turn their houses into rubble. But if, in verse 6, but if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So it seems that, that um, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he realized that there was something very different about his dream. It, was prof- it needed prophetic interpretation. But he knew he had a lot of men around him who, would, who were probably very good at speaking and could explain away anything that he didn't want a, a foolish answer. So he asked them to, to tell him his dream without him telling them it and then interpret it. A, a seemingly impossible task, right? In verse 17 it says, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Surrendered prayer is prayer required in situations that have stripped away all dependence on things of this world. Money, power, position, all unreliable and undesirable for surrendered prayer. Oftentimes, you don't know what the answer will be or or if there will be one. All of your university degrees, your masters and your PhDs, completely useless in this arena. None of the king's advisors were up to the task. As it says in Isaiah 55, verse 8, God speaks, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could not depend on their own strength, their own wisdom, or those of Babylon, but in God and in His provision. When I think of surrendered prayer, I think of when I first came into our church in the year 2000. I was inundated with examples of sacrifice and a church on fire with prayer. From the authors having recently moved to South and a vibrant growing ministry built on prayer, to Roger and Margaret and others giving up the comforts of Trinidad to move to St. Vincent to plant the church there, also built on prayer. We had many a prayer walk and all-night prayers from around the Savannah to Mount St. Benedict all at various households and even walking from Port of Spain to Arima as Justin did. And then some of us following him from Sandy Grandi to Mayaro, walking and praying. So we could see the power of God work through prayer. We often said we'll go anywhere, do anything, give up everything for the sake of the gospel. And many people strove to live out Acts 2, the Acts 2 template in their lives. When I think of surrendered prayer, I listened um, to Francis Chan share how he started a church in his living room and it grew to thousands of people. A year, they pledged 250,000 US dollars to a world hunger fund and they just didn't have the money and the deadline was fast approaching. The Sunday before the deadline, he and his staff had been praying and when the money was counted that Sunday, it was exactly 250,000 US. Or another time when they had a conference and they had planned to feed the poor, except that they had run out of meat and they weren't going to be able to feed the vast number of people that were showing up. They prayed and then someone from Trader Joe's called to say, the strangest thing happened. Our, pe- our power went out and hasn't come back on. Do you mind taking our meat? Exactly what they had prayed for. The following year, they had the conference again. Guess what happened? Uh, their power went out again. And Trader Jews called again. The strangest thing happened. The power has gone, 
and hasn't come back, would you mind taking our meat? God works in these kind of incredulous moments. It may seem incredulous, but God works in mysterious ways and oftentimes when we are completely out on a limb for Him, with no way seemingly out, and we are praying together, He shows up for us when it is we put ourselves out on a limb. Are we playing it safe in our spiritual walk? Are we actively together in a position to impact this world as we pray surrendered prayers for God to open up His plans for us? As it says in Acts 4 verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Let us pray together and, and may God shake the ground and enable us to speak His words with boldness. My final point. A fellowship of courage and confidence. So there's going to be a bit of scripture reading here, so get your Bibles ready. So in Daniel 3, reading from verse 4, it says, Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations, peoples of every lang language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediate, immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there, in verse 12, we go down further, it says, But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship the image of gold I have set up? In verse 16 it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if He does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Reading from verse 9, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace seven times hotter than usual. In verse 20, and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. So the men who lifted them up to carry them there, because the furnace was heated seven times hotter, they died while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the furnace, still bound. In verse 24 it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty, he said. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fort looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. His tune has changed. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. In verse 28, the Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. 
They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses burned, <laughs> turned into piles of rubble. For no other god can save in this way. If we were asked to worship a false god under the threat of death, would we abandon our faith? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not give way to these threats, but encouraged each other to stand up to Nebuchadnezzar's. Um, in clear and precise terms, they stood up to him. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the god we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he, will, and he will deliver us. You hear the confidence? From your majesty's hand, in verse 18. But if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The confidence, the courage, the conviction with which they face up to that particular challenge in the face of death is amazing. They were confident in what they believed, defiant in their response, almost dismissive of the king. Such was their faith in God. Should we be challenged like that, would we be confident and defiant as they? This, I think, is much more possible when we are part of a fellowship whose faith is that strong. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, apart from witnessing what their own nation's idolatry brought onto their own nation, the destruction and enslavement of their people. It would have been burned into their hearts and mind the eventual cost to pay for such unfaithfulness to God. They weren't about to make that mistake again. Plus, God's provision for them, especially in captivity, their positions within the king's service were because of God. When God had saved them by revealing the king's dream and interpretation of that dream to Daniel, how could they now turn their back on God? So they, conf they confidently refused to bow to this idol. They were thrown into a fire seven times as hot as, as its usual temperature. The men who carried them were burnt up. But then they are not burnt, miraculously. But in fact, were walking about freely in the furnace. And the Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth person, and he describes him as one like a son of God or a son of man in some other in um, translations. Who is this person? Nebuchadnezzar eventually said it was an angel. But the use of that term is the same term used for Jesus in the New Testament. Personally for me, I found it strange that it was used here. It made me ask, could this have been Jesus who saved them out of the fire? Their confidence and defiance and refusing to worship any other god was rewarded as they stood up to the king. Would we have that kind of courage? In certain countries of the world where Christianity is not the major religion, people are constantly asked or forced to renounce their faith. You know, I was listening to um, um, something online recently where a young girl was being asked to, to change from, from Christianity to Islam, and she refused because the guy who was asking her wanted to marry her and she needed to convert first. She refused. The young man was so enraged and I don't know if in, in love, or his version of love, but he took a gun and he shot her in the head because he could not have her because she refused to convert to Islam. Would we have that kind of courage? In communist China, at times, it has been outright illegal to meet as a church and it has forced the formation of the underground churches. China is one of the places where the church is growing its fastest under oppression. In countries where there, there are these kind of totalitarian states. Christianity is growing in spite of the oppression and the challenge that they are facing. If that were our situation and our comforts, possessions, and even lives were threatened, would we be willing to hold on to our faith in God and in His Son? In the New Testament, um, in a particular church community, when faced with persecution for their faith, they were tempted to turn away. An unknown Christian writer inspired by God wrote then the letter to the Hebrews. In Hebrews 10 verse 19, it says, so you can turn there quickly. 
Hebrews 10 verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You see, Jesus has appeared to all of us Christians. And what's more, his spirit now resides in those of us who have believed, repented, and been baptized. In verse 23, it says of Hebrews 10, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, very much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we must spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, even in the New Testament, the importance of the fellowship is outlined in helping us to maintain and grow in that courage confidence, and defiant faith in God. How many of you all are missing in church, on online church, or doing some other thing than setting aside this time for God? In verse 26 it says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Is in the fire of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace was hot? Wait till you see God's fire. In verse 28, it says, Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God on the foot, who has treated as unholy the thing, the, un, as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God will not look lightly if on, continu on, on continuous unrepentant sin, nor will he take lightly anyone who denies him. In verse 32 it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in great conflict full of suffering, in verse 33, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting promises. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For he who is coming will come in just a little while and will not delay. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back, but my righteous one will live by faith. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. This church in the book of Hebrews, there wasn't like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where it was a in-your-face moment. It was a gradual drifting away and denying of God. Be careful of that drift, my brothers and sisters. Stay anchored in God. Stay anchored in the fellowship. And let us build up, as my point says, a fellowship of courage and confidence. In conclusion, times are changing. The attitudes and behaviors of those in the world are heading down a path that will lead to a challenging world for us as believers. Are we looking forward to COVID-19 to be over, to a return to normal? What if things are not going to be the same? And our way of life, the way we worship and the level of hostility towards Christians start to increase. How will we respond? I believe God is giving us an opportunity to repent and to retrain ourselves through the fellowship so that we can stand when the day of testing comes. Will we be a fellowship that one, disciplines our appetites? A fellowship, two, that practices surrendered prayer? And three, a fellowship of courage and confidence? 
I believe these will tell whether we stand or fall. Let's go before God in a word of prayer this time. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, as we come before you, we thank you for this opportunity as a church that we could examine um, people who would have lived actual lives, who would have suffered and struggled. And it's not some story, God, that um, is far away, God, but it's in your word and it's there for a reason to guide us. We too face challenging times, Lord, with COVID-19, a world where um, you know, attitudes and behaviors are, are really going um, from one extreme to the next. And we are caught as Christians in a world um, where, in a sense, we do not belong. We, we live in this world, but we are not of this world. But yet we are called to face up to the challenges of our time and to stand firm and hold on to you. I believe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel have shown us what is required of us to discipline our appetites, God. Help us, Father, to be a holy church, to be a church that is surrendered in prayer, that we are not dependent on, on our money or resources or education or any of these things, God, that we can hold up as idols, but we, we lean and depend on you. And Father, I pray, God, that when the, the moment of testing comes, when someone or something asks us to denounce our faith, that we will stand up with confidence and defiance to hold on to our faith so that you are glorified, God, because we believe firmly and absolutely that you are able to save us. And even if you do not, we will not still bow down to any other God. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Please be with us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.